uh, Bold Start Shemek Ghosh. We'll be sitting down with three very forward-thinking enterprise security execs. We have David Hahn, CISO at Silicon Valley Bank, Brian Heemsoth, Exec Executive Director, Head of Security Operations at CBS, and Brian Lozada, CISO at HBO Max. I want to begin uh, by introducing our moderator. We have Shomit Ghosh, Principal at Bold Start Ventures, a day one, first check partner and true believer in enterprise infrastructure and SaaS founders. Bold Start is often the first investor working closely with technical founders at company inception. And notable first check investments include Sneak, Customer, Big ID, Superhuman, Security Scorecard Front, and Fortress IQ. Before I pass it along to Schmick, we'd like to get a feel for our audience today. So we're gonna run a quick poll. Launching it right now. So we'd like to know who is joining us today on this webinar. Please let us know. Just pick one, pick the one that best describes you. Okay. Still coming in. All right. Okay. So it looks like several, it looks like we have mostly uh, employees at startups. Um, investors uh, and uh, employees at enterprise, non-exec. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, let's go ahead and I'll hand it over to Shomit. Let's get started. Thank you, Natalie, for the great intro. Um, I'm Shomit at Bold Start Ventures and we'll be the moderator, moderator for this event. Um, we will try to answer Q&A throughout, so please feel free to submit questions by clicking on the Q&A uh, button at the, at the bottom of the screen. Um, and with that, I'd like to have uh, each of our uh, forward-thinking security execs introduce themselves. So I'll pass the mic over to, uh, to David Hahn to kick things off first. And uh, David, one of the questions that I think we will also ask is uh, for you to put uh, your, your favorite movie or show that you've watched um, uh, during this time as we're all looking for, <laughs> for recommendations these days. Okay, well, great. Thanks, Shomek, and thanks for having me on. Uh, so yeah, David Hahn, uh, Chief Security Officer for Silicon Valley Bank. And um, I won't go into Silicon Valley since we're kind of sponsoring this as well. So, but, um, you know, for me, my career spans uh, many years. Um, and I used to be in banking a long time ago with Wells Fargo um, when uh, things were seemingly a little simpler. But, uh, you know, as we go through, I worked at Hearst, which is a big a media company in New York. And so that's why I had recently moved. Um, also spent time at Intuit in a software company. So, you know, I got a chance to work on a lot of different areas. So, um, you know, it, it's certainly, a, a, I would say, a great time and a challenging time to be a security professional these days. So plenty of opportunities, plenty of work to do, and there's no end in sight. Uh, but, you know, it keeps us on our toes. And so always glad to uh, keep working. As far as something to watch, well, you know, I really haven't been watching during this time. I'm so b busy working, and that sounds kind of lame. But there is just no short, I mean, the work week with Zoom meetings, I feel like I'm working all the time. But I would say my favorites probably are Ozark. Uh, if you guys have ever seen mm -hmm. Ozark, that's just like totally cool. And then, you know, Breaking Bad is just, you know, my all-time favorite. Uh, but if I have time, I, I would love to go back and like rewatch the whole thing from beginning to <laughs> and go totally binge on it and then stop figuring out how to money launder. And, you know, but I shouldn't be doing that since I work at a bank. Not a good <laughs> idea. I'll turn it over to uh, the rest of the guys. Uh, so, so a funny story. I've actually done that that Breaking Bad series uh, uh, earlier this year. So <laughs> it takes quite a long time. But uh, Brian H, maybe let's let's uh, go with you next. Yeah, thanks, Shomik. Uh, Brian Heemso, I lead the security operations organization over at CBS Health. So uh, security operations, incident response, forensic, cyber investigation, and also uh, related to that, our consumer identity and fraud resilience and investigation teams uh, roll up to me. Prior to that, I spent my entire career thus far in healthcare, spent many years at Aetna uh, in similar roles and also a little bit of time in the AppSec space at Aetna as well. Uh, uh, prior to the integration or the acquisition of Aetna by CBS Health back in, in 2018. 
As far as a, a show for me, you know, I think the quintessential answer you're supposed to give in these pandemic times is Tiger King, right? I think everybody or a lot of people are a little bit mesmerized there for a, at least a weekend. I, I know my wife and I went through that. It was a, a pretty dark time in, in late March. Uh, but I'll actually go with a more classic answer. Uh, I did a rewatch of The Wire recently. Uh, I've seen it two or three times, but it just uh, it, it grabs me every time. So if you haven't seen it, I uh, I couldn't endorse it enough. So go out and watch it. It's on uh, a couple of different streaming platforms. That was perhaps the best handoff we could have asked for 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 uh, for Brian L. So Brian, we're all looking forward to uh, to hearing what you have to say, given given uh, where you where you work. So please go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. I'm Brian Lozada. Um, I have the distinct privilege of uh, leading the security team at uh, HBO Max, which recently just launched a uh, new streaming platform uh, uh, that's offered by Warner Media. Uh, prior to uh, HBO Max, I was at uh, I was the Chief Information Security Officer for ZocDoc, uh, so heavily regulated uh, healthcare uh, startup. And then prior to that, I was uh, CISO for for, for Condé Nast. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here. As far as binge watching, uh, I obviously have to pick something from uh, from from the Warner Media catalog, right? So I would say there's a few things, right? The scheme that the H HBO just came out with uh, not too long ago. Uh, that one was actually uh, really good. And then uh, Game of Thrones. I mean, you can never go wrong when, when, when you binge watch uh, some Game of Thrones. Indeed. <laughs> well, thanks for those great suggestions, everyone. And uh, really excited to have um, uh, these, these you know, truly forward-thinking uh, security execs here to kind of share their insights. So, you know, I, I'd like to dive in um, actually with, with, with David. So, um, you know, David, uh, SVB has been, a you know, long been a digital first bank. Um, but I imagine with work from home, uh, there, there must have been quite the spike on usage of, of SVB's, you know, customer facing apps. Um, mm -hmm. And so how has SVB kind of ensured security during, uh, during you know, that increased usage? Um, and has there been any notable changes that, that you've seen from a, from a security perspective um, compared mm -hmm. to pre-COVID? Yeah, so, you know, I'll first start kind of on the, um, on the employee side, you know, in terms of how we handled it and then kind of switch over to the kind of the customer facing side of things. So, you know, we were fortunate to, you know, plan ahead and not that we obviously knew that this was going to happen, but more in terms of being cloud ready and cloud first. So that's been a journey that we've been on for many years. Uh, so as we began to, you know, the all shutting down our data centers, going to the cloud, but then really utilizing all the SaaS services that's available. I mean, it's almost to a point that you, that's the only choice, right? If you go to, you know, who wants to run an exchange environment uh, using Microsoft, for, you know, email anymore, right? So you, you got to go to Office 365. So with that, you know, kind of became a big flood. So that and a bunch of other stuff that we had, uh, you know, always worked toward basically kind of a zero trust model in terms of protecting the endpoint. So when you have those things in play, it really was the, the best opportunity for us to you know, fully take advantage of that. So the initial going home, you know, uh, was not a major issue. Uh, because I felt like we had the protections in place. Certainly, you know, the attack surface in terms of more people, could, you know, could get attacked. Uh, you know, certainly people's home Wi-Fi's are not always the, the most uh, secure in terms of whether people even realize how they have it set up. Um, so, you know, you have those types of issues to be concerned with. But again, because of the, the cloud first and utilization of a lot of the SaaS services and then many of our security teams, uh, tools and you know, controls that we have are also cloud based. So given that, you know, it seemed like those were all the key things and elements that we had in place. So really, there was very little um, kind of a transition and people, it was just more mental. Again, you know, endless Zoom meetings and all the things that people have to worry about, but it certainly wasn't a technical issue and, um, you know, dealing with that. And kind of switching over to the customer facing side, I mean, clearly, you know, our customers have always been there. We do not have a huge branch network. Uh, so we, we have a few, uh, we're, we're not like a Wells Fargo or BOA where, you know, the, the issues that they have to deal with, right? In terms of figuring out how to keep their branches open. Uh, you know, during this pandemic. Uh, we had some, took care of that, but yeah, for the most part, I think our customers knew to work with us uh, on an electronic basis. So that's always been a part of it. Um, you know, in terms of whether the, the, the amount of attacks have spiked or not, I think, you know, there's ebb and flows, different things. Uh, people who are in financials or, you know, others have seen a huge spike in terms of account takeover, so, uh, but that goes across, right? It's not just financials. I'm sure healthcare has seen it. Uh, other parts of that. So I think those types of things have always been ongoing. So you just have to be more cognizant of it, uh, protecting your customers and be vigilant. But if anything, I think it just puts more light to it. So uh, I would say 
for us, we just continue down our path of, you know, not only digital first, but being able to really get our customers to create an overall process in terms of doing their banking uh, digitally so that they can automate on their side. So many of our customers are really, you know, not consumers, but more business customers. So it's really more about helping them, you know, kind of automate their back office, their treasury functions, the controllers, all the different pieces there. So I would say those are the key pieces that I've seen so far. Uh, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. And thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, Brian, I, I think at CVS, you had a, a fairly large demand spike as well. In fact, I think from the, from the recent earnings release, CVS released stats saying that virtual visits through uh, Minute Clinic, which is CVS's urgent care service, were up 600% year over year. So quite, quite the spike. So, you know, how did, how did CVS re respond to this demand shock from an IT perspective and continue to provide a, a high level of security under that stress? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, from a workforce perspective, uh, we were fortunate in that we we're already a pretty big company, uh, about 300,000 employees, but about 100,000 employees full time work at home. So there wasn't a lot of reinventing the wheel as far as enabling our workforce workforce employees. Uh, there certainly was a lot of added capacity, right? You know, previously, our high watermark for uh, concurrent VPN users was when we had a Northeast snowstorm and everybody from Maryland to Maine was was work at home. Now you're talking about a whole country's worth of people, an entire workforce. So uh, it was a good quarter to be our Cisco rep uh, or to be a Palo Alto rep and, and cash in on some ASA equipment that was purchased. Um, you know, but more promising uh, on that front is it's really brought to the forefront a, a number of good conversations across the enterprise and across IT leadership about is this really the right way to continue enabling our workforce and uh, you know, is there a better way than the hairpin model? So, you know, definitely, uh, uh, you know, a, a great, um, you know, sign of things to come there. Uh, the digital engagement side has been really interesting. So as you mentioned, uh, we're seeing our, uh, our clinics uh, see patients at, at record rates. Our overall digital engagement across all of our mobile and web channels is up about 70%. Uh, our mail order pharmacy uh, is up 300%, right? People weren't leaving their houses in March, April, and May, and, and largely still aren't to go pick up their prescriptions. Uh, and there's ever growing needs for care uh, and, and pharmacy uh, supplies and prescriptions and such. So, you know, we've seen this tremendous set of expectations come from our customers around how we provide services for them, which has really helped propel our digital organization to uh, offer new solutions that meet the uh, crazy needs of, of our current society and, and some of the restrictions that we have in place. Um, you know, for instance, we have mobile test scheduling. Uh, I guarantee you that uh, mobile COVID test scheduling now, I, I guarantee you that was not on any roadmap in March uh, or prior to March. Uh, uh, you know, and now it's one of the most heavily used features of our app. So uh, a lot of great work there. Uh, and on the security front, specifically driving a lot of great conversation around how do we continue to enable these digital functions, but do so in a way that uh, limits account takeover risk and improves the fraud resilience of our app. So uh, definitely a very exciting time. Yeah, and excited to dive into uh, uh, the, the last part that you mentioned a little bit more later on in, in this discussion. Right. Um, and, and, and finally, Brian L., you know, uh, I, I think you had the pleasure of launching a new service in, um, in the uh, entertainment area, no less, which, which everyone's sitting at home and watching more and more TV and streaming services. So can you talk about, you know, what was it like to, to launch HBO Max during this? And, and again, you know, from a security sp perspective, launching a new product, um, how, did, how did that work from the uh, HBO Max organization? No, that's a great question. Uh, definitely a, a, an interesting challenge. Uh, we actually started working remote probably like the beginning of March. And the product, HBO Max, launched May 27th. So for the final few months of actually finalizing the product and getting it ready for, uh, uh, you know, to, to launch, we were all remote. So one is we had to adjust to the workforce being 100% remote and start looking at uh, how we're managing that workforce from a security perspective. Uh, Warner Media had a great plan and just was able, that seamless transition of the workforce was, was there. I don't think we, we had too much of a hiccup there. Uh, but the, I think the challenges were like the unexpected of, of uh, just not knowing how long this was going to be a thing and, and how long we were, we were going to be uh, remote was always uh, kind of like a concern. Uh, but delivering the product, uh, 
launching that product uh, during the pandemic and actually seeing uh, kind of like the usage of it since it's it's being launched is pretty exciting. Uh, there's still a lot of folks that are that are are, are home, and you actually can see um, see the viewership and and see how it, it spiked up. Uh, we still have some of the metrics of of like prior HBO Max or HBO Now, which was our other streaming platform. Um, that you could see that viewership as soon as as the pandemic hit uh, just spiked dramatically. So um, it, it's exciting to see, but also like looking forward, how do you build uh, the product, thinking about the customer and now the customer's new work life balance is going to be more of a remote work life. Uh, so we got to start thinking about how we uh, innovate on behalf of the customer and that new experience, but by driving these, uh, you know, the, our, our streaming platform through that. So, and then on, on the employee workforce side, we were always, always there, right? So continuing to focus on the employees live in the browser as it is most of all of our applications are, are SaaS based or, or browser based. So continuing to focus the security efforts in the browser um, and then like zero trust or treating everything as hostile doesn't become that much of, a, uh, of an issue because you're focused so much on how, how the interface of, of the user and in, in, in the browser is. So, uh, But that's how, how we focused. And, and um, I just feel like there's going to be a lot more opportunity from a business side as the new norm is going to be the remote workforce. Yeah, and, and I'd like to dive in uh, into that area a little bit more. So, you know, ha has security changed at all or the security priorities of the business changed at all um, uh, due to kind of re remote work for, uh, you know, remote workforce? Um, you know, I think one of the things, for example, is like I would assume more VPN products were added to the IT stack. But are there other areas or priorities that have surfaced as focus areas during this time? And maybe we can start, um, Brian L., since you were just speaking, maybe we could start with you and then, and then go from there. That's a good question. You you speaking about VPNs and stuff like that? It's a t it's a time to really think about how do we get out of that old mindset of that we have to have the employee VPN in to get their job done. So it's actually taking a step back and saying how can we still provide that secure experience with that remote uh, uh, workforce without having to rely on this traditional uh, kind of like software that that relies on on you know v that phone home type of of technology or that phone home type of approach. Uh, so we have taken a, a, a look at it and saying how. Um, what, what exactly does the workforce need to get their job done remotely? And then let's optimize and build that infrastructure to support that workforce in that manner. And a lot of this old technology is not going to be existing in, or it's not going to apply in this new world uh, like these VPNs. I'm not saying we're going to get rid of all VPNs, but there's an approach that you could really tie in with a lot of uh, SaaS providers and, and, and identity managers that could help manage uh, that risk for you. Um, and it also helps focus your workforce, uh, HBO Max specifically, if our engineers aren't focused on improving the customer experience and they're spending time and resources on just improving the infrastructure for the employees, that's a bad balance. Our job is to improve that customer experience. So the more we focus on just opening up the environment so that the remote workforce can operate uh, securely remotely, um, it's going to uh, put a lot more time back into the product and just improve the customer experience. Got it. And, and David, you know, I think what Brian mentioned there was a lot about the remote workforce and, and kind mm -hmm. of enabling that. Is that similar to what you were seeing at, at yeah. SVP as well? Yeah. So, you know, even before COVID, we, we, we had planned out a, an SD-WAN rollout to, you know, all of our offices uh, throughout the world, basically. So, you know, getting away from this notion of backhauling traffic to the mothership, uh, the mothership really doesn't have anything anymore, right? Because we moved everything to the cloud. So really, you know, that is a continuation of what we had in plan. But again, you have to complement that, right? Just doing SD-WAN or, you know, going to that model isn't going to, you know, you got to get to, uh, you know, SaaS-based tools, for example, in terms of, you know, proxying all your web traffic. You still have to be able to have a cloud service that could do that. Uh, you don't want to choke point it in your data center, but then you have to have a service who could do that. And, you know, I won't name the vendors, but, you know, there are certainly a few that are out there who can do that. So the same thing with, uh, I mentioned Office 365, right, in terms of what you're getting from there. So as that had been going on, we were already planning uh, to move down that path, you know, with SD-WAN so that we basically start moving out the network and then there really is no longer the old traditional network anymore. So it's opened up and then, but you gotta, yeah, protect the endpoints. So, you know, we're a little different maybe, but we control everything from the desktop. So all uh, employees are issued one. Uh, we do have some BYOD, but it's usually uh, related to phones, but nobody's allowed to bring a BYOD when it comes to a work uh, station or a laptop, right? So there's certain things that, you know, we felt it was imperative for us to control. 
again, it, it, it begins to create some issues. Oh, I want a Mac. I want this device. I want that device. And we'd be like, no, okay, yeah, this is it. Right? So I mean, th th there's a bit of things that you know everybody has to work toward in terms of what they're trying to do. Fortunately, you know, again, I'm, I'm not uh, recommending anything, but I, I think the, uh, the Windows uh, workstations uh, in the last five, six years have gotten so much better. Uh, you know, so I've actually switched myself. I used to be a long time Mac is so now I've switched over. It's like, doesn't seem to any different to me. So again, so from that standpoint, I think you get away from this notion of, oh, I like this type, I like that type. So uh, getting uniformity on some of those basic tools is, is really, uh, I think, a way to go about it. And then back to what Brian was talking about, it's the application that's in the cloud or that's in the browser, right? That's the key thing, focus in on that. And you know, as that has gotten better and better, that's just the way. It's no longer like they're asking me. They're going to do that, so we might as well figure out how to support that model and then forget about trying to bring things in. You know, remember, VPN was never a security product. It was never built for that. Uh, it was a network, a connectivity tool, right? That's, that's what it is. So trying to then take VPN and make it into a better security just doesn't make sense. Right? So I really think that it's already opened up, so you might as well try to figure out how to secure people as they're already going to the cloud. Yep, got it. And, and Brian, what, what about from the CVS perspective? I mean, a, anything that, that has kind of a, a, a change or, or, or you've seen that shift? Yeah, very, uh, very similar set of experiences to Brian L. And, and David, right? You know, we've got, uh, you know, perhaps a, a longer tail than some organizations will have on our, on our path to being 100% zero trust, right? Just based on decades of, you know, old legacy applications and mainframe devices and such that a lot of our employees still use. Um, but, you know, we do have certain subsets of employees that only use productivity tools, right? And that's a number measured in tens of thousands, right? And, and we've had very serious uh, movement to bring those folks to a direct to cloud uh, model where we're not hairpinning uh, on the VPN and we're removing access for those users and, and going to the zero trust model for them, um, you know, and making iterative, uh, iterative but you know quick um progress in in enabling those features so pretty exciting times yeah so so you know i'd I love to dive in actually into that uh be, that zero trust security that we we always talk about because it seems like a buzzword you know ever since google published its beyond court white paper i feel like that's that's what everybody in security is talking about um and, and maybe i'll give a super simple simplified explanation um so zero trust security is basically moving away from the paradigm of trusting everything that was in the network and within the firewall. So zero trust security really means that no one is trusted by default inside or outside the network. Um, you're actually using kind of verification uh, required from everyone to, to, to grant access to the resources on the network. Um, and so really, you know, for Fortune 500 enterprises, that seems like a massive shift and, and really requires um, a, a lot of work to go from the systems that are already in place to this kind of fully zero trust security architecture. So can you kind of talk about the challenges and the constraints and, and how that's, that's moving forward for each of your organizations? Um, and, and, and Brian, I guess, uh, what, why don't we start with you since you just talked? Yeah, great. You know, and, and you're correct. You know, we, we certainly view Beyond Corp and, and what Google's done there and, and now what they're productizing, uh, you know, as the North Star. Um, you know, looking at, at our environment, right, you know, Fortune 5 company, uh, tremendous uh, IT footprint. Um, you know, we certainly are going to have an iterative approach with a long tail to get us all the way there, right? You know, and the uh, certain aspects of this migration will be easy, right? Uh, you know, a, a user on a new device uh, authenticating to Salesforce or Office 365 or a, one of the Google collaboration platforms, incredibly straightforward. Um, you know, where we're going to have the longer tail is going to be uh, anything uh, internally developed and supported, and we have thousands of those applications. Uh, because those will require the re-architecture, the redesign, and uh, the investment to, uh, to expose them directly to the internet and to take advantage of, uh, you know, modern device and, and user auth capabilities. So, you know, that's one opportunity that I think really exists in this emerging market is help big, you know, old companies like us, uh, you know, make this migration and, and make it, uh, you know, as cost effective as possible. Um, and also, you know, understand that, you know, uh, uh, a small startup uh, or a smaller organization can probably, you know, do at a much quicker velocity what, uh, what will take us, you know, a longer time just based on the footprint and, and the funding realities and such that exist. So, um, you know, not, uh, 
you know, not that I'm trying to say we, we try to do everything uh, as slow as we can. It's exactly the opposite, but it's just a reality, um, you know, within a larger enterprise that I, I think uh, is a real challenge in this space and one that the, the vendors that are able to, to really ease that migration will, uh, you know, really reap the rewards in terms of the enterprise adoption. David, do you have a similar experience as well from that from that kind of complexity? Of yeah, I, I mean, I'll definitely jump in. I, I mean, it, it's always going to be a hybrid, right? You're going to have that. So unless you're born on the cloud and you're like, you know, you started up yesterday, right? Uh, you know, banks also have a traditional set of, you know, mainframes and running AS400s and, you know, you still have that. So I, I think it, it's that proper. So it's a security strategy that has to incorporate taking advantage of zero trust capabilities, as I explained on on our strategy with laptops and how we try to control there. But yeah, in terms of other things where that may be, you still got to then tried and true network segmentation and being able to, you know, break up the, uh, the risk there. So, you know, I, I think it's this whole notion of a defensive depth, right? Fundamental good security hygiene, right? You got to have a defensive depth strategy where you got to say where I could take advantage of zero trust, where I could take advantage of things like SD-WAN and going to the cloud. Where other plays, no, it's going to be segmented. We're going to limit the usage. So in all those things, the key thing that I see as still a big risk and continues to be is the logical access of things, right? So, you know, we could set up all these things and that's what we're seeing with account takeovers and, you know, what the bad guys are doing. They're just going to impersonate that I'm, you know, Brian Lozado and I could have all of his access and do all the things that he can do. There's nothing that these other controllers will be able to stop me unless I'm looking for that. So what I see is that we could set up these uh, places, we could have a hybrid model going through, but unless the network side and then the logical side of identity come together and really understand the mind of an attacker and what they could do, you know, you're still going to be susceptible to that. So I think that's the key piece that I see more and more is that how to do it. Because the bad guys will kind of like, okay, I, I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to get it. Okay, all right. So I can't do that. Oh, I'm just going to steal identities, right? And the ability to steal credentials is, is still very easy. Uh, to do, even with multi-factor authentication, you can actually still do that with social combination of social engineering, and we've seen that uh, happen there. So I, I think there's got to be more that, that we will all need to do to really be able to understand people's digital identity and as they're operating in whatever capacity of zero trust or network segmentation that we have in place to really make sure that we bridge them together. Yep. Brian L., you got any, anything more you'd like to add there? No, I think, I mean, uh, both Brian and David uh, hit it right on the head, but David has a really good point. Like, it does depend on where, where your infrastructure is. If you were born in the cloud, hey, moving to a zero trust model is a lot easier than if you have some, some data center infrastructure or bare metal infrastructure that you have to migrate. So it really does depend on that. Uh, but that, to David's point, again, focusing your program or focusing your approach on data and then people, right? If you know where your data is and then you follow the people, the consumers of that data, uh, you'll be able to understand where identities need to be mapped and, and how you get actually protected from, from, from that aspect. So if you follow those two flows, um, I think you can get to that zero trust so that everything's hostile model uh, without slowing down your business. Because you have to understand that data flow and understand how your people are consuming that data. Uh, as long as you understand that and build around that, you'll be able to scale with them. Got it. Um, you know, I think we have some questions coming in as well, so I want to uh, want to get to those. But I just have one more thing that I'd like to uh, dive into, which was earlier on we talked about how security needs to be uh, an enable an enabler, right? It can't just be um, a, a bottleneck. Which in some cases, some people call it that because they're like, oh, we got to check with security before we ship. But really, it needs to be something that is you know continuously thought about um, to make sure that um, uh, it, it's not compromised, since it's so important for all, for all of us. So. You know, how do all of you address security um, and, and make sure that it's top of mind in product development, um, but also you know, not holding up the developer and product teams from, from accomplishing their goals? Um, and, and so, you know, maybe said differently, how do you drive business value in, in security? Um, you know, I, I don't know, David, if you'd like to start with that and then we can go from there. Yeah, not easy. It's a kind of frank way to get through that, right? So yeah, unless you ingrain uh, security that literally the developers, are, you know, already know that they, they become the extension of the security team, it's always kind of a, this chasing uh, aspect to that. So, you know, the, you know, we've heard of DevOps, well, you got to get into this DevSecOps, right? So there's got to be security that's sandwiched in, be, in through that. So I, I would say it's a constant um, amount of work, right? So it's not just providing technical, you know, recommendations or technical, you know, architecture in mind there uh, is actually having to really explain it to provide the awareness. Where do they do it? 
just from a number standpoint, there's probably like, you know, 20 to one in terms of number of developers and IT folks versus the number of, you know, security, right? So you can't go chase all those things down. You know, when it comes to things like incentives or that, I think in this day and age, everybody knows that, you know, a bad security breach is not a good thing, right? So it's not like you have to practice, preach that, but I think you have to talk more about in terms of the impact and how you can prevent things from occurring. And then you got to take lessons from whatever something, and then we find out about a bad, you know, coding vulnerability, you know, two days before they're about to launch. You know, what do you do? Well, the security guy said, okay, you can't do that. You're going to be the guy providing the bad news that we can't launch whatever HBO Max, right? I mean, I'm sure, right? Yeah. That just, and they're like, what the heck? Are you crazy, right? So the lessons learned from that is this discussion should have occurred six weeks ago, six months ago, right? And then why didn't that occur? Right? So you got to keep kind of winding your way down. So definitely it's not just, a, you know, it's also process. You got to have built into it. So the people who run the IT's kind of process management or change control, I mean, there's a lot of different places that you can and have to adhere to it to make sure because you want them supporting you just as much. And if we have a good change control process, a good architecture vetting process, all those things, my job will be so much easier. So really I'm going after those key areas to make sure that the hard conversations occur back then versus if I got to be the one, you know, holding back everything two days before production, I'm going to be losing and, and, the, and the company will lose ultimately. Right. And that's the bad. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, Brian L maybe, uh, you know, in the context of that launch of HBO max and doing that, like, was that something that you had to ingrain the culture oh, totally. beforehand or how, how, how did that work? Yeah, totally. I think, look, a lot of the security, when you're building security into the product, it's about culture. So I think the first thing, uh, David hit on a lot of good points. You're talking about DevSecOps and, and, and uh, DevOps. But one, uh, from a security perspective, create a brand. Get yourself out there. Make yourself visible and make yourself a partner to the business and offer yourself as a service to the business, right? DevOps and, and application developers, they're just trying to get their job, push, push through their pipeline and get things out. But get, get involved, right? Uh, on on, on on uh, my team, we actually have a DevSecOps lead, and then he has two uh, cloud security engineers underneath him. So they actually work with the SRE team. They actually put things right into to, to the actual pipeline and take that thought process away from the developers. They don't have to think about if they're using the right Terraform template or if it has the right uh, controls in place because they just use what we're giving them, and it actually kind of like orchestrates it. The other thing is providing awareness to the application developers, become a partner, understand how their pizza squads are broken up, like how their sprints are going in, inject yourself into those sprints and, and just be a partner. Instead of coming in with like controls and saying you must, you shall, you have to, get at the ground level, you know, go to war with them and really understand what, um, what their process is and then align security to that so that you don't slow them down to David's point. You can't go two days before uh, you know, product launch and saying, Hey, you forgot to do X, Y, and Z uh, from a security perspective, you have complete extreme ownership of that product, whether you were involved or not, right? You have to have that ownership and know that any decision you make is going to impact the customer. So get involved early, be a partner early, understand the requirements early so that you can be part of the build process. Yeah. Br Brian H. Uh, how, how do you manage that at CBS? Yeah, I, I think both David and, and Brian nailed it here. You know, one of the, the failure points I've seen for executives in, in many areas, security included, is not building the proper relationships at their level and only looking out for, you know, their own interests, their own objectives, right? That would be like the traffic cop CISO, right? Who says, you know, I only care if it's secure. I don't care if the business objectives are met. Um, you know, and that's a, uh, that's a, a quick way to be unsuccessful and a quick way to get yourself run out of town. And uh, unfortunately, you know, it can be, it can be sometimes be commonplace, right? So it's incredibly important at the executive level, CISO, senior leader, um, whatever, or whoever, you know, understand who your key stakeholders are, who your key customers are, and understand, you know, what they're being held accountable for and what value they're looking to drive for the business and understand how security can fit into that. And uh, nine times out of 10, just by taking that, that simple action to align your visions and your missions, you'll find that you as a CISO will end up with uh, tighter enablement, I'm sorry, tighter integration between the security function and uh, the business and the IT teams uh, and everyone below you will enjoy that same benefit. And the products that get delivered will be at a higher level of security and you'll be meeting your security objectives with less consternation. So that executive relationship building uh, and maintaining that relationship is, uh, is incredibly important and sometimes missed, unfortunately.
Yeah, it, uh, great points. And, and, and so we, we have some questions from the audience that um, maybe what, what I'll do is just say, whoever wants to jump on this can, and then if you'd like to add, um, uh, please feel free to add to it. But um, uh, the, one of the questions from the audience is, um, you know, given the level of innovation in the security market, how do you all secure the budget for unfund and un, un, unplanned expenditures? So when you need to purchase something just because of what, you know, whether it's COVID-19 or something else, um, how, how does that work in terms of, you know, finding budget and, and, and getting that pushed across the, the org? And uh, whoever wants to start, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I mean, I'll jump in there. So uh, a couple of things there. So one, being a bank and as heavily regulated as we are, there's almost this sense of like, okay, we will find the money, you know, type of a, an approach there. Uh, but, you know, as a businessman, you always have to think of like, okay, if I take this, you know, do I have to take something away? And so, you know, you have to have that mentality in terms of you got to still solve business problems. If you continue to cry wolf every time and say security needs money, needs money, needs money, you know, it kind of gets old for a while. So you got to be a, a business partner as well in terms of what can we do? So, okay, let's push aside this initiative. We're going to go to there. We got to make trade-offs, right? So, what, you know, I, I don't like to just kind of go and say, I need money. I need, I need, I need, uh, because, you know, you, you kind of not only get labeled for that, but then you're really not showing the value on that. So I think it's a trade-off business. Like every, like any businessman, you got to get through that. So, you know, you know, I usually try to have a you know, discretionary budget line uh, in my budget every year to go through and then, you know, I'll tap into it. You know, I'm also making deals. You know, I, I got the IT teams over there. So, okay, I'll help you with that. You know what? These are all real life things that we do, um, you know, as we try to get through it. And then ultimately, we also have to uh, realize that is this a top risk for the company, right? You got to get that buy-in because I'm out there sweating. And if nobody knows I'm doing this or nobody understands like why is David so concerned about this or that, then it, none of that's gonna resonate, right? So I think you really have to make sure that there's a consistent basis. For example, being able to report to the audit committee or to risk committees. And you know, I think those are the legwork that you have to get through so that make sure everybody understands. And so even though they may not give me money, they're basically validating, yes, yes, there is a good reason that we should be behind that. And those are the things you need to make sure so that people understand when I'm going to the bank and asking for something, uh, that there's true value to it, and it's a you know it's a priority. Brian H or Brian L, anything to add there? Yeah, I would agree with that, right? The, especially the importance of continual education for your stakeholders on the top risks specific to your organization, right? So if you go to your board or to your CIO or whoever, you know, you're, you're trying to hit up for money tomorrow and try to educate them about a risk that they have never heard anything about from you before, you've really missed the mark, right? So um, one thing that, that we found to be very successful over the years is to have a quarterly exercise where we look across all of our different business units, retail, mail order pharmacy, our insurance division, and quantify all of the top risks that exist in those business units. And then, you know, also, uh, you know, put that together into an enterprise wide list. And we talk about that with the board and with the audit committee and, and with the other groups that we interface with. So we have that continual education about, hey, these are the things that really matter for CBS Health. And these are the risks that we need to be aware of. So if we run into a situation where, uh, you know, we don't have discretionary money and, and we need something, you know, hopefully it's more of an exercise in, hey, remember this thing that, that we've been talking about every month? Well, you know, uh, X, Y, Z just happened and the risk is ratcheting up a little bit and, and we're a little bit, uh, you know, naked here in our defenses uh, instead of, you know, trying to go through the whole, you know, song and dance of, of teaching that new. So it's, again, it's important to have relationships and that ongoing communication with all your stakeholders. Yeah, this is Brian. I, could, I couldn't agree more. I think the key point uh, that Brian was making there is the, the relationship piece, and I 1,000% agree. I, have, uh, I, I, I make it a point to establish really good relationships on the finance side directly with how we're managing the budget. Um, and then as I build out the budget, um, I always have uh, contingency funds in there in the event of unknown risk, uh, compromise, something like that that we could tap into for that. Um, and and I've had to, to, to use that in the past, but that's a way that I've done this for unexpected spend um, is, is to have that contingency fund in there. But then on the other side, uh, to Brian and David's point, it's relationship and partnership. If you tie the risk 
uh, to uh, the business mission. If it's something that, if you can articulate the risk um, that it's going to impact the business or the consumer directly, you can make that case to, to get that funding as, as, as appropriate. So I think you just really need to have that ability to translate risk into business, articulate it back and map it back to the, to, to kind of like the business OKRs. And, and it does, it does equal out to, to, to get you the funding that's, that's needed, but you have to have that relationship and the ability to communicate. That's 90% of the CISO's job is that balance of, of communicating risk and, 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 you know, supporting the, the resources to address that risk. Right. So uh, communication is such a big key and partnership is such a big key with that aspect. Yeah, you know, I think an interesting question is um, uh, on the on the communication standpoint is actually we, we have so we have a bunch of startup founders and and uh, and folks who are working at startups that are in the audience. I think the biggest question that everyone has right now, right, is is hey, we all want to work with your great organizations. Um, how do we do that, especially right now uh, in in remote work when you have all these different priorities going on? Um, and so, what's the best advice that you would give for for startups uh, uh, looking to to partner with with all of you during this time and um, wh whoever, David, it looks like, uh, uh, if you want to take that first. Yeah, well, I, I'm kind of in a unique position on Silicon Valley Bank. We actually bank, you know, lots and lots of uh, tech startups. So uh, there's no end in terms of companies who want to come uh, talk and all that. So um, here's what I would say. One is um, too many companies have single point functions, right? It's, it's not a platform. It, it's not some ecosystem. It's a, it's a feature. It's a function, right? I could do this thing. And it's great because that's essentially where the innovation comes. I mean, no, you know, even big companies aren't really doing R&D anymore, right? So that's where the source, but it really be becomes an add-on to something else that you have there. So I think the key thing to really try to explain is not that I'm the best at everything and this is the greatest thing you've ever seen, but more of here's how I can complement what you already have or here's the process or here's what we can do, you know, to that. Be a, uh, you know, something that ties together with it and, and have that be a, your key message, right? Because then I could see what it is you're going through there. Um, and then the, the other thing is just be honest. I mean, really, we get so many uh, coming at us. You know, I can't answer my phone. I mean, my emails go through spam. I mean, the number of things I got to try to do. But, you know, among there could be several, you know, very good valid things. But it's just hard because I got to filter through so much noise. Uh, on that and then companies who hire these like literally like professional salespeople like that's all they do I mean they like oh please you know kind of give us a break so I think that information and the other thing that I always advise is you know many many um, you know firms work through venture partners like Boldstar work with these guys right because I can certainly feel comfortable having a conversation with you know Boldstar or any of because you guys have skin in the game right because you're obviously you know invested into companies and there's a reason for it and so it's not just a sales pitch, right? It's, it's basically, you know, saying, hey, look, we've done so much research because all our, the venture partners have done hundreds and hundreds of hours of research, right, into companies. So I think they have just as gr great of an insight to be able to see the difference and all that. So, you know, those are the type of things that I rely on because I need some kind of a vetting process and filtering process to kind of figure out what really is valuable uh, to look at uh, because I just cannot answer every phone call. Uh, I mean, it's not, not possible. We promised we didn't pay David to say to work with both sides. <laughs> uh, uh, Brian H or Brian L. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll counter that a little bit, right? So it's uh, you definitely have that reaction where you say, okay, well, you know, I hope this company gets bought because you're a really great feature to product X that I already own. The uh, you know the counter risk to that is to be a Series A company and come in with this PowerPoint slide of product suite and roadmap that looks like semantic Broadcom, which is not a compliment in any way, you know, to say. but, you know, it just begs the question of what actually exists and who's actually using all this stuff and what percentage of this uh, PowerPoint stuff is, uh, you know, vaporware that you're going to write as soon as you sell it to me. Um, so, you know, I, I always admire the companies that come in and they have a defined problem and it's actually a problem that exists for, for me and for others. And they're looking to solve it and they're looking to do it better than anyone else. And uh, there's a lot of great examples of that. Um, you know, but meanwhile, when you have a company that comes in and says, well, I can do everything. I'll cure COVID. I'll, you know, be your authentication solution. Oh, you need an IDS. I'll be your IDS. You're like, well, what do you actually do? Right. So, you know, there's a very important balance there, uh, you know, with either end of the spectrum, you know, eroding the confidence that somebody like me will have in a solution. Right now. 
Yeah, I agree with both David and, and, and Brian. I think, look, if startups want um, to start talking to me, I think a, a good uh, uh, way to do it is like do some research on my on my industry streaming. Try to solve a problem. Like we're not uh, like this isn't uh, uh, we're not coming out with anything new, right? So the, the industry's been around for a while. Try to solve one of our problems to come in that way. Um, we all have vendor fatigue, man. Like every every new security vendor out there could solve our problems and they could do everything. They're the silver bu bullet. So be particular, be specific to the industry, be specific to me, make me feel like I'm valued and solve my problem. And don't come in and tell me like bells and whistles and buttons and bright colors. None of that shit matters to me. Like solve my problem, right? Solve my problem. And the other thing is like, if you're a, a startup security vendor and you're an alerting tool, don't call me. Like this is 2020. If you are not automating remediation, don't call me. Don't even forget I, I exist. Like if you are not fixing anything, no sense even looking at me. I, I, I love that. And, and it's one of, the, one of the greatest things I think about this is, is what you said was, you know, research, define entry points, uh, and, and then through that research and define the entry point, solve, solve a direct problem. And then from there, you can, you can evolve into kind of more of a platform that takes care of everything. So, you know, I think that's a really great approach for all these uh, uh, companies to, to take and, and look into. Um, we have a, a, a one here that um, talks more about kind of data privacy um, and, and PII. And so how, how does that look? I know a lot of the organizations now have kind of a chief data officer, but security is definitely involved in that as well. Um, and so during, during COVID with increased uh, digital engagement, um, is, is data privacy uh, something that security still kind of actively thinks about or is that a, a separate component? I mean, I'll jump in there. Absolutely. It's even more critical because, uh, you know, people need access, right, to get to it. And then, then they have this perception they need to have more of it and they need to get it more directly on that. So the notion of, yeah, whether it's a chief data officer, which is really more of a strategy role in terms of being able to enable versus like a chief privacy officer in terms of trying to figure out how to protect and then meet all the regulatory or or laws that are out there now in terms of playing. So those are great partners to work with if you have those types of roles. Certainly makes my job a lot easier, okay? Because then I focus on the technical controls, I focus on the, the, the capabilities of, to do, and then they work more on terms of understanding all the business enablement issues through like what are the 2,000 different ways that they're dealing with data, which like I can't even keep up with in terms of how uh, they're working on it. So, uh, you know, it's important to, to be close to that because ultimately, I think Brian said earlier, you got to protect the data. Okay. It's all about the data, right? So you got to know where it is. So if you don't have a good inventorying system, if you don't have the ability to not just inventory, but then to uh, know what's moving on any given moment, not like two weeks ago or three months ago, but your ability to know where all the data is on, on a real time basis is crucial. Uh, as you get to that. So there's a lot of work to get to that point. But yeah, you got to find those good partners to get through there, which will then absolutely make the job. And likewise for them, I mean, they look to me, they're like, okay, David, you're the one that's got to protect all this, right? And it's like, okay, we're in this both ways, you know, you let's, so that's the part where you got to break it up and make sure that the partners are working. Because if you as a CISO try to do all those things, oh man, I mean, there's just not enough time in the day to handle that. Brian L, any, any thoughts you'd like to add to that? 1000% agree. It's like understanding that, that, that partnership because you want, you want to be part of the business so that they could tell you this is the product that we're thinking of launching and the data that we're trying to consume at that point. So you could help them architect that infrastructure that's going to support it. Um, and then as it's in the business, to David's point, there's going to be a lot of folks that want to use that, that, that data. You need to be a partner to that, that, that your chief data officer and, and, and really understand how to democratize data responsibly and, and you know, collaboratively with that uh, chief data officer so that it's done in a way that doesn't slow down the business but gives that that level of responsibility from a security perspective that you're not opening yourself up to, to risk. So you, you really have to have that partnership. And, and I think in, in taking it even farther back, understanding your data life cycle, you can't protect or really put any guidelines or, or visibility around data if you don't know it exists. So really do that diligence and find out uh, to, like the products, how they're consuming, storing, processing, transmitting that data. Where's the persistent layer? How is that data being used? How is it being deleted? Do that so that you could put that support behind it and support the business. Uh, nowadays, every company in the world is a data company, whether they want to accept it or not. You're going to make decisions based off of data. You're going to innovate based off of data. So it makes sense for security to be very much involved in the life cycle and the protection of that data.
Um, and and, and uh, so here's another question that we have from, from the audience here. And, and Brian H., maybe I'll, I'll give you a first shot at it. Um, uh, so one of, the, one of the questions is really, you know, um, is security a topic that is now addressed at the management level like of, of, these, of these public companies? So is it something that uh, truly, you know, not only the board, but, but the management teams, everyone actually cares about? Um, and, and if so, you know, how do they care about what sort of high level metrics, KPIs are they interested in? Like, how do they actually tangibly address that? Um, if, you, if you'd like to start with that. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. And actually very timely. Uh, before we got on this call here, I did my weekly update with our COO uh, on, uh, on security matters, right? So I think, you know, to a degree, the manner in which you educate those individuals will come down to their preference, right? You know, one of the really interesting things about John, who's the, the COO for, CB, uh, for CBS, is he likes to be pretty granular and pretty deep in security because he knows a lot at his enough at his level that, uh, um, you know, it keeps him up at night. Right. So, you know, we get to the granularity of talking about what the significant incidents were that week and what the countermeasures were that we implemented, what corrective actions are we implementing over the short term and long term to avoid recurrence. Um, but, you know, we, uh, we also try to balance that with a focus on different KPIs that measure the effectiveness of our security program, right? How long does it take us to identify and detect and respond to threats? Um, you know, how are we trending compared to our industry peers versus a, as compared to a number of benchmarks, right? You know, that's, that's a question we're asked to answer uh, routinely a couple times a year, it feels like. How are we doing compared to the broader retail industry and the broader healthcare industry? So having effective mechanisms uh, uh, and measurements that you can use, or you can have a, a third party leverage uh, uh, an assessment of your program is always uh, is always a good idea. So, you know, definitely a, a preference here. You got to kind of feel it out with, with your executives and your board and, and see what they want to hear. But, um, you know, being able to mail to nail that once you understand what, uh, what they're looking for is critically important for your own success. Uh, David, do you want to uh, opine on that as well? Yeah, no, definitely a good end. I mean, just like any, you know, problem or co complexity, you know, you got to speak it in a language that they can understand. You, you got to be uh, patient, you know, to be able to go through a meeting that it's not a one time thing. You know, wh wh whenever I you know, help with board members understand, it's not like, okay, one meeting done. No, no, it's continuous, right? Every quarterly, you know, board meeting before I check in, make sure they understand what's going on. And then, you know, they also are hit by news that they hear, whether it's Wall Street Journal or whatever other thing. And like, is this relevant? Well, how does this impact us, right? Because it may be obvious to us, you know, who, who do this every day, but it's not obvious to everybody else. So they're trying to understand how does that impact uh, all those things there. So I think those are great opportunities, right? To take some major news event that occurred, but then tie it back. Uh, how could that happen or how could that not happen? you know, for us, because that resonates. So I remember years ago, I remember the Sony breach when that occurred, and uh, Brian, you know, you're, you're in media, you, you remember what that was like, right? It wasn't until then, when I was heard that people actually understood, oh yeah, that could impact us, or how it go through. And then remember, security is also, I would just say three key things, that, you know, it's confidentiality, you know, in terms of the data that you could lose, it's integrity in terms of the, uh, the data that could be changed, manipulated, and availability. Right? So the Sony situation, availability was kind of the key thing. They totally messed them up so they couldn't operate. So you know, if you have television stations uh, that operate, it's all about availability. If they can't broadcast, you know, and Brian knows this very well, right? All the media outlets, if you cannot broadcast, they're not worried about credit card numbers being you know, stolen or anything like that. So you got to speak that language to say, yep, I'm totally about availability, but I'm going to talk about how bad guys can screw you up so that you don't have availability. Then they understand it because, you know, TV stations and media, they can measure how much money they lose by having an outage of one minute or even 30 seconds, right? They know exactly how much that is. So if you said, okay, we could put this investment in, okay. So that's what I mean by speaking the language, Stu, that they can comprehend and understand. And you have to make sure that security is very complex, but narrow it down to what really impacts them. Yeah, I 1000% agree. I mean, it's speaking their language. Uh, to my earlier point or David's point, it's about communication, that partnership, understanding where their pain points are and, and showing how you can enable to remove those pain points or how it's going to relate to them, I think is very, uh, uh, you know, very important. And then being transparent, I think is the other key thing too. I like to make my security roadmaps public 
I let everybody see them because I want the entire business to see where we're going with it. Cause there could be uh, someone that is doing something that doesn't know that, Hey, maybe we should reach out to security or maybe I, I need to partner with them. And, and, and it's an, another way for us to, I'm encouraging the other teams to also share their roadmap because there could be areas where we could partner together as well. So I think transparency is such a big thing because it, it, it drives the opportunity for them to come to you and the business to come to you. And again, we're, uh, I think David mentioned it earlier that sec the security function now, is a business enabler. It is no longer that go to security when you have a problem. It's go to security to do it right, right? Or, or to help get it out there right and keeping the consumer in, in, in mind. So it's just reinforcing that approach um, and, and just continuing to communicate that and offering that up to the business, I think is, is, is incredibly helpful. I, I like to create things like the office of the CISO and then I create like newsletters. Uh, we have a logo. We send out things to engage the, the, the community, always keep it top of mind for them. Um, so it just all, keeps, keeps constant engagement with the business and it's, it's important to maintain that. So, so last question here, and Brian L, I'll keep you in the hot seat. Uh, uh, so what problem is not being solved in the security landscape today? <laughs> wow, that's a big one, man. Like, you know what? I think uh, um, a, a few things, right? The, what is not being solved in the security landscape? I think we need to focus more around behavior and getting around behavior because, uh, look, the network's dead. Perimeter's dead. Like, we are now in a remote workforce. Everything is a little bit – we're in a software-integrated world, so we need to start focusing on – identities and user behaviors and how to attack or at least visualize and monitor that aspect of how we inter interact with consumers, products, employees in that world to give a lot more visibility because, I mean, again, we're, we're the, the, the next you know, phase of, of evolution is we're all going to be 100% remote and this is a software integrated world. So I want to see things more based on behavior. I want to get rid of the password too. Like the password is the most ridiculous thing. Let's get rid of it, guys. Let's move forward and, and, and just leverage things like biometrics and other things that we could leverage to just get rid of the password. D uh, David, anything you'd like to add there? Well, I'll add it this way. And I think it was one of the questions that came up, which is, uh, you know, the vendor kind of management side of things. And so I think we've too much have done these questionnaires, fill it out, da, da, da. there's a whole cottage industry, right, built around it. And a lot of companies are there, you know, again, I'm not owning them, but it's really like only a point in time. You know, what good is that two years later or any time soon? So I think that this is notion that, look, we're, we all have skin in the game. Hey, all you SaaS companies, you guys have done great and early adopters have, got, but it's my data, okay? So don't forget that, right? I'm giving you, so what, I have to pay to, for you to give me logs? You know what, no, that's not right, right? What, there's no SSO? What do you mean you don't support SSO? This is like easy stuff, right? And so I think there's almost like a, a set of things that if you're a SaaS company, you must do these things. You know, it's not negotiable, right? And these are things. So I don't, you know, it's great that you have a great security program. It's great that you got a SOC 2 report, but that's table stakes, right? What I want is for me to control it. And so, you know, whether it's CASB or other things, but yeah, simple things like I want to control login. So it has to come through SSO that I control, okay? There's no negotiation on that. I need to get the logs because if I can get all transaction logs from you, I can put that into my SIM. My team could actually respond to if there's an attack. I'm not going to wait on you to tell me, you know, so I think we got to change that paradigm of vendors saying, don't worry about it. Trust us. We're good. You know, glad you could sign up to be more of here. How can we be of service to you and how can we work with your security team? Right. So that, you know, the security team at the company is truly managing it. The, the model has changed. It's no longer in a data center. It's in the cloud. That's fine. How do we now do that? And so I would like to see that become like a norm to go through it versus me constantly arguing with these vendors to say, give that up. That's my data. You should be giving it. Why do I have to negotiate that? Why do I have to not pay more for that? So, you know, those are my pet peeves that uh, I've been dealing with. <laughs> I love that. Brian H. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't want to say we need another SIM vendor because it's such a crowded marketplace that probably three have launched in the 55 minutes we've been on the phone here together, but we need someone to come along and solve the use cases that we're trying to solve with our SIMs better, right? You know, help me do threat detection, help me do threat response. Like Brian said, help me uh, automatically mitigate, you know, what's, what's going wrong in my environment. Um, you know, we, we've got 25 terabytes of log data every day flowing into our SIM platforms, flowing into our different security data analytics tools and our different repositories. And still 
too much of the threat detection falls on the shoulders of, you know, junior and senior analysts of what they're able to pick out of a haystack. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think that I've got a pretty smart team of folks working on uh, content development and, and use cases on a variety of different platforms. But, you know, we, it, we're, that's still a market that's ripe for disruption and, uh, you know, certainly one where whoever figures it out is going to have people beating down their doors uh, to, to give them money. So um, please help with that. We need it. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Um, thank you to everybody who joined us today. And just a special thank you to uh, Brian Heemsoth, David Hahn, and Brian Lozada. Um, we look forward to hosting all of you again at another Bold Start C CXO Connect. Um, please follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, we are at Bold Start BC. And on our website, you can sign up for our newsletter. Thank you all. Uh, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone.